So uh, today I'm going to share with you our company story of how and why we decided to add uh, statically typed language to, to our project. And uh, yeah, I wanted to introduce myself a bit, but Artun already did. So uh, yeah, I, I'm a tech lead of the Hasura console. So the project where we wanted to add the statically typed language. And you can find me as Alexander says on Twitter and Biros on GitHub. I also have a blog, alexander.codes, where I, I complain recently about stuff. And um, this is the agenda. So at first, I will make you a bit familiar with Hasura and the front-end project, so you can get an idea of, of uh, what, is, what is the type of the project that I'm going to talk today about. And then I will tell you why we want static typing in the first place. And I, I will also do a brief overview of these four languages and uh, tell you how did we compare them. And in the end, I will share you uh, share with you what was our choice and what is our plan for the adoption. So um, Hasura Engine is an open source project that uh, auto generates GraphQL APIs over Postgres. It connects to your data sources like databases and uh, some external APIs, some microservices or service functions, and produces real-time real GraphQL API. And uh, on the front-end side, we have the console where you can, for example, try out those APIs in the GraphQL panel. You can manage your database in the data section, as, as I'm showing on the uh, demo on the slide. You can also uh, set up other Hasura features like remote schemas or events or actions. So, uh, so this is this project uh, where we wanted to, to adopt statically typed language. So now that you have some really brief overview of how it looks like, I can go to the reasons why we wanted static typing. So uh, each project and each team is different and might have some, some really specific uh, reasons why static typing might work or may not work. So uh, the, those reasons that I'm going to talk about, some of them will apply specifically to us. But I think some of them will be more generic, so may apply to, to other teams as well. So uh, the first reason is that JavaScript is not enough. So uh, this language is really powerful and browsers only speak JavaScript, so we, we kind of need to use it. But uh, this language also has some quirks and can make our life miserable with uh, with a lot of things that are going on uh, in this language, for example, like this thing that I'm showing on the slide. And uh, also, as this is dynamic language, uh, there is some kind of like a trope that you see those errors cannot read, cannot read property X of undefined. And uh, sometimes how you test if your app works is kind of in your client's browser. And uh, as we, we have this open source project, we have like uh, issues reported to our GitHub uh, repository. And uh, also, as I said earlier, and uh, as I was introduced, I'm a tech lead for this, for this project. So I'm kind of responsible if something is broken. So we have this like a GitHub Slack integration. So whenever someone is adding a new issue, we have like notification on Slack. And uh, every time when I see uh, undefined or type error in the title, I have like mini heart attack and it's, it's not cool. And I don't want it. At least I, I would like to reduce it as much as we can. And another thing is that when you are trying to present something and there is another runtime error out of nowhere, and it wasn't even recorded for the purposes of this talk. It was kind of like I was doing, I was really recording a demo and it kind of happened. And then I, I kind of assumed that it will be like a best fit for this 
talk. And uh, we have like a lot of complex features. For example, here uh, is a permission panel where you can set role-based permissions for your database. And uh, it's not only complex from the UI perspective, uh, it's complex from your app perspective, if you think about the whole authorization thing for your database. So uh, if something goes here, it's not only inconvenient, it's, it may cause some, some bigger problems. And um, and as, as we have those complex features, we need more control. We, we need language that would give us more control. Another thing is that dynamic uh, typing is not enough at some point. So uh, there are just two classes of type systems, uh, static and dynamic. And programmers kind of embrace dynamically, type, dynamically typed languages for prototyping, for testing uh, ideas, for shipping large and complex systems really fast. But when it comes to maintaining and evolving the systems, uh, the, the lack of explicit static typing can sometimes become a bottleneck. And uh, as the project grows, it's not enough anymore. So we have built Hasura console uh, frontend in JavaScript but uh, right now we are far from being a prototype. We are uh, like a mature big project. So uh, this, is, this was the moment when we needed more control. And what I mean, uh, because I'm saying this control thing uh, very often, and what I mean by control is a kind of like correctness, uh, amount of bug free lines in the code base. And what I mean by speed is how fast we can ship new features. So uh, one of the most obvious benefits of static type checking is that it allows uh, to detect errors really early. So um, so that, those errors that uh, that are detected early can be fixed immediately uh, instead of just like lurking in the code and be discovered like much much later. For example, in a client's browser. And as we have this uh, control, refactoring becomes much easier. And we actually do plan a major refactor. And I think we all know that when refactoring JavaScript, big JavaScript code bases, uh, there are a lot of things that can go wrong. So this uh, a little bit of help of static type checking can, uh, I think, will be highly appreciated. Also, as I mentioned before, Hasura is an open source project and we uh, grow really fast, which we uh, both hire new developers, also have some help from the community. So, uh, so this is also another thing that is important for us to, to kind of make this onboarding experience easier. And what types are also useful for uh, is reading programs. So uh, those type declarations, uh, they, they create some kind of, some form of documentation, giving some hints about behavior. And unlike some descriptions in comments or some external, uh, like external sources of documentation, they cannot become outdated because they are type checked during every run of the compiler. And what they are helping with, they are giving uh, answers for those three questions immediately. So what argument does it accept? What value does it return? And what external data does it require? So uh, you can think of that, that you, you, we have this API of our modules, of our functions. So uh, sometimes we don't need to go into very details and read the whole code to, to know the basics about, about it. We also have a uh, greatly typed backend. And then when we are getting uh, data to the front end, we are losing this type information. And what we could do instead uh, is we could have operation between, between server front end code so that we, we have the full stack type safety. Um, and for example, we could also uh, auto-generate types from the, from the Haskell code. So, uh, as I mentioned earlier, our browsers only speak JavaScript, so we are kind of forced to use this language, but uh, maybe we can change this perspective and uh, stop thinking of JavaScript as a programming language, but rather as an environment or a build target. 
And now the question is which language that supports JavaScript as a build target we should choose. So um, I think we can discuss this, this part of the presentation now. So I'm leaving uh, uh, to, to Artyom to, to ask questions. Yep, I hear. So yeah, currently we have maybe uh, four questions. So the first one is, uh, uh, why don't you write more tests instead of reworking frontend with static type language? So um, I think it's not like one or another. I think we can have both. And it's like a test kind of keep you, can help you make sure that all the happy paths are covered and your program works as expected. And what static type uh, typing can help you with is uh, ensuring that, you know, bad behaviors won't happen. So, uh, yeah, we do have a lot of tests. We have so much tests that we are waiting like a lot of time every time, uh, like when we are running uh, like uh, continuous integration. And uh, so we do have tests, but now we need more. Okay, and uh, the another one question it's about uh, uh, choose of static type language. Uh, why? What do you think? If you would use dynamic uh, type language, but strong type, uh, but which have strong type system like Clojure script, uh, could it solve Hasura type problems? Uh, if it cannot, why? Uh, yeah, it probably would solve Hasura problems, uh, but so. Yeah, I'm going to talk about this later, actually. But uh, we kind of we we knew that we have like a big choice. We we could have uh, choose like the, those four languages. We could, we could have uh, chosen some uh, something that is compared to Wasp or uh, something like Clojure Script. But we narrowed our choice to those four languages based on the what our team wanted, what people at Hasura wanted. So, you know, there were basically there were four people who suggested four different languages and, uh, and this is how we narrowed uh, our choice. Okay. And, uh, I don't remember maybe at 12 slides, uh, you show, uh, the feature to describe a role with constraints, uh, for the yep. roads. Yep. And, uh, uh I think in how static type language help uh, to describe this role. I mean, that's, it's like a dynamic data structure, which will be um, extended and extended by the user. So how it, how static type language can help with this feature. So, uh, as, as far as I know, it's not, uh, it's not migrated yet. Like mm -hmm. this part of the code base, but there is like some strict, like, I mean, there, this permission part, it has some form, so it can be easily typed in, uh, in, in, uh, like we can add typings to that and we can ensure that every time we are, you know, either, uh, getting this permissions data from the backend on where, where we are like storing it, it, uh, in our local state, uh, it has this structure. Mm -hmm. Okay. And uh, the last one for this part, I think, uh, uh, is uh, did you think to use a language with uh, will have target not JavaScript but uh, WebAssembly? Uh, like, for example, we had a talk about the Rust language framework for building front end. It's you, if I write pronounce it. Mm -hmm. uh, for uh, so it's an uh, Rust language which will be compiled to the uh, WebAssembly. So because WebAssembly is uh, a third language which could be interpreted by our browser. Yeah, so uh, it's also an option and the answer is similar to, to the uh, closure script question. We, um, we knew that we had, we have a lot of options, but still, if we don't have, if you wouldn't have this like a uh, leader who would pursue one language and who would kind of like take ownership of migration for the particular language, then this migration would be, uh, would be kind of harder. And as we had those four people who were kind of into those four languages, then we had like potentially those four leaders who would take over the, the migration, who would help the migration and so on. 
Okay, I think uh, for this part, we don't have any questions. So we can com uh, continue mm. your talk. Okay, nice. Um, so I'm going back to the slides. So uh, I have this slide, why these four options? <laughs> uh, now it's kind of like uh, I already answered uh, this. We, we basically, we had four people who suggested four different languages and we decided to go with them because, uh, you know, I, I think this is really important to have uh, have someone who specializes in, in the particular language to, uh, to kind of be with this migration process. And um, I'm going to do some kind of like a walkthrough uh, of all of those languages. And how we are going to do this is I'm going to uh, kind of show you a piece of code that uh, is doing the same thing. It renders a simple login form. So to, to input one button. And also what I probably haven't mentioned before is that our stack includes React. So the examples I will be showing uh, will also be in React if if possible. So uh, for for those who are not uh, familiar, I'm going to explain what happens here. So we have like a simple JavaScript right now, and what do we have here is uh, I'm I'm declaring uh, state variables name and password by using your state hook from React. Then I also have two, two simple functions for handling uh, changes to, to the inputs that are setting those uh, state variables. And I have JSX that renders this form. So I have a parent form component and uh, it has three children, two inputs and one submit button. So the first language is Reason, and uh, Reason is a syntax extension for Occam. And uh, like Occam is a statically typed language um, with some object-oriented features. And uh, Reason provides the same features as Occam does, but its syntax is, uh, is more similar to JavaScript, so that adoption by the JavaScript programmers is easier. And here is our code in Reason, our form. So at first I'm adding a declaration that tells that we are building a component, React component. Then I'm also declaring uh, state variables. Uh, in here, the, the difference uh, that you can spot is that I'm using round brackets instead of square ones. And also to, to the use state hook, I'm, uh, I'm providing a function instead of just just a string as a default argument. And I also have those, um, those two handler functions. And uh, you can notice here that we are providing types for the first parameter event. And uh, we are also explicitly saying that the return type is unit. And uh, then what is going inside of those uh, handlers is uh, I'm, I'm piping the argument to the target function, the, the, the arrow means uh, pipe, and then I'm accessing the, the property value. And this is uh, the, the JSX that is responsible for rendering this form. So, uh, so in a similar way as in, in pure JavaScript, uh, I have parent component and uh, I have two, uh, I have three children components. Now the, the second language is PureScript. Uh, so PureScript uh, has been around for about seven years and uh, is currently maintained by the community. Uh, it's inspired by Haskell and ML family and uh, it's a purely functional programming language with a really powerful type system. And uh, I also used, uh, here's also an example of React. I used uh, React basic ho uh, hooks library. And, uh, and what's going on here? I have the, the type declaration that, um, 
that I'm uh, building React component. This is an effect of React component that takes no props. And then I'm also using a use state hook from, from this library React basic hooks. And I'm uh, declaring uh, state variables, name and password. And this uh, backslash slash operator means uh, it's an operat operator alias for, for the pool. And here is the, the part of the code that is responsible for rendering the form. So, uh, so this there is this R that form a parent component and also uh, three children and they are accepting props. In here, uh, there, there's one difference uh, to the previous examples that I'm inlining the unchanged handlers inside of the uh, of the, the input uh, props. So. Uh, the third language is TypeScript. So uh, what's, what's the most important thing about TypeScript is that it's a, a superset of JavaScript, which means that any valid JavaScript is also a valid TypeScript. So uh, yeah, so it also means that basically you can change the extension from JavaScript to uh, TypeScript and you have a valid TypeScript file. Also depends on compiler settings, but uh, that's more or less uh, that. And um, what's also important to notice here is that it's not completely new language. It's, uh, it's JavaScript, basically, with, uh, with some additional features, but also with most of the JavaScript pitfalls. And here's our, uh, our code for, uh, for the form in uh, TypeScript. So uh, also I'm uh, providing type declaration and saying that this is functional component. And I'm using React uh, use state hook to set name and password state variables. This part of the code is exactly the same as it was in case of uh, JavaScript. And then I have those two function handlers uh, on name change and on password change. And here also the, the, the one difference between JavaScript and TypeScript code is that I'm providing a type for the first argument event. And here is the uh, JSX and uh, there are no changes uh, comparing to the JavaScript code. Everything is uh, done in exactly the same way. And uh, uh, our last language that we, uh, we were exploring is Elm. So Elm is a purely functional language uh, designed in around uh, uh, 2012. And uh, yeah, it uses some, some things like uh, facts, sports, and some custom elements to communicate with JavaScript. And it also has its own architecture pattern and the three, uh, three concepts that are like the core of the Elm architecture are model, the state of your app, view a function that, uh, to turn your state into HTML and update a way to update your state based on the messages. Now let's see this architecture in action. So, uh, so here we have the, the model part. And we're saying that uh, there will be the name, there will be name and password in, in the state. And uh, in the update part, we are defining a function that based on the first parameter message is updating either name or password in the state. And um, then we have view part and uh, this view function is using a helper view input to make things a little bit more organized and uh, is rendering our form. So um, this is it for the like quick sneak peek into how, how the code looks like. And I think we can, uh, uh, we can go to the Q&A session for this part of the talk. Yeah. So yeah, uh, we also have three questions for this part. Uh, so first one, Evgeny Kot is asking us, did you hear about Dart language? Did you think about using Dart language on the front-end side of the 
Uh, honest, I mean, yeah, I heard about this language, but to be honest, I never considered it to, to, to use it. I mean, is anyone using it uh, except for Google? <laughs> I'm not sure about this. Yeah, actually, uh, a company which uh, built uh, and oh. it's a ma management tools, uh, it's uh, uh, named mm -hmm. right. Uh, I worked in this company before and uh, as I, as I know, and I used uh, Dart in this company, so yep, <laughs> not only Google use Dart. Uh, the second one is, uh, which one React binding do you use for pure script on 20, 29th slide? Uh, this is library called React Basic uh, Hooks. Yeah, and it uh, has it's... like all the bindings for React. Oh, okay. So it's not only for the hooks. No. Uh, and the last one is about CSS and JS. What about CSS and JS uh, in uh, all mentioned languages? Uh, for example, I yeah. know that uh, Reason React have a um, namespace called uh, uh, React DOM dot style uh, for create style inside your component. Uh, uh, but what about pure script and Elm? <laughs> Uh, yeah, so so as you know, like TypeScript is JavaScript, so this is easy. I mean, every CSS in JS library that is working in JavaScript is also working in TypeScript. Then with Reason, we have uh, those bindings for the most popular CSS in JS libraries, uh, for example, for emulsion or style components. And uh, in case of ELM and PureScript, there are also some libraries that are providing this, uh, like, CSS in JS uh, functionality. So um, as, as I remember for PureScript, it's something called a PureScript style sheet. It's kind of like a work in progress. I mean, there are probably more, but this is the one I heard about. And uh, for Elm, there is something like Elm CSS uh, that is also like supposed to do this, uh, you know, you write your uh, CSS next to your components, and then you have it in the like, head of your document. Okay, that's all for the part. Let's continue. Yeah. Cool. So, okay, now is the comparison part. And, uh, you know, the, the languages, all those four languages are, uh, are different from each other in, in many regards. And we can't say that one is the best one and the other one is like the worst one. So uh, what we can do is we can compare them with the aspects that are important for us as a team and for our project. So take a look at this diagram and uh, you have this, uh, this legacy land in the bottom uh, left corner. So uh, with with this legacy code, there is almost no control and the development speed is rather slow. And then we can improve this. Uh, we can add framework like React and uh, significantly improve the development speed. Then we can add prop types and we can also improve the development speed and a uh, bit of uh, control. And uh, then with more tools, with, with like different frameworks, with different languages, this uh, development speed goes up. But at some point, it kind of starts decreasing because having more control means that we need to write more demanding code. We need to be careful with types and so on. And uh, sometimes we uh, we need to spend like the significant amount of time uh, figuring out the types. So um, also like uh, the the more uh, the, the more type safe language is, it also can mean that uh, it has more con constraints. So there's always this trade-off. And what we need to do, uh, we need to decide where do we want to be on this diagram, how much we can give up on the development speed, if any, and how much control is enough for us. So. Uh, these were four the most important points for us when uh, when comparing the, the languages, when discussing about the languages. And the first is like uh, JavaScript interop. So uh, it was important because uh, because we have like a big code base 
And we, we also knew that we can't migrate uh, the, the whole code base at once. It's not even possible. That, that's not even something that we want to do. We wanted to take this gradual approach that, for example, the, the new code would be in JavaScript, uh, in sorry, in a new language, and uh, we would leave the, the old code in JavaScript. So, um, so this coexistence of uh, JavaScript and another language was uh, really crucial for us. And another thing is steering curve. So uh, we we wanted to maintain developers' productivity. So uh, so it was also important that uh, like that uh, developers in our team would be uh, confident and comfortable with the, the language that we we would choose. And uh, the the first thing is no migration cost and easy setup. So this is also kind of. Uh, kind of connected to the second point. We need to, uh, we don't want to spend a lot of time on this. We want something that would work for us uh, really quickly. And then there is, of course, stuff like ecosystem, ID support. So we also want to maintain this, um, uh, this, like, uh, this comfort that we have with JavaScript, that there are some tools, there are uh, IDs, uh, for for JavaScript, that there are many many things that can uh, can kind of help with uh, our developer experience. And now I'll, I'm going to give you uh, some kind of like a sneak peek of what is needed to set up each of those languages in the existing JavaScript project. So uh, the first one is Reason. Uh, so Reason requires. Uh, ES platform as dependency, and it will concurrently compile reason files to JavaScript. Uh, that then will be consumed by the, the JavaScript uh, modules. And it also requires config for your project with some like, dependencies list and, and so on. And what's, what's important here is that uh, package manager remains the same, so you can still use uh, NPM or Yarn, whatever you want. Um, so, uh, with PureScript, uh, PureScript has its own package manager. I was using Spago because it was also a build tool. And, uh, and how, uh, how my setup looked like is I added a Pure's loader to, to my Webpack config. And uh, I was like uh, compiling PureScript files in parallel. And uh, with TypeScript, and, uh, TypeScript can be uh, transpired with Bubble. So what we need to do is add another Bubble preset uh, called uh, Bubble preset TypeScript. And uh, it also requires uh, configuration files with some compiler options and, and some other project settings. And, uh, and I, I also used uh, Forked yes, uh, checker webpack plugin uh, that runs uh, like a, as a separate process, and uh, and do this whole type checking for TypeScript files. Um, with Elm, uh, what you need is again a configuration file. You need uh, executable Elm uh, to be installed globally. That would be like both package manager and build tool, and so on. And I took like a similar approach as with PureScript. I'm uh, I'm compiling those um, files uh, in parallel uh, with uh, with Webpack Loader called um, Webpack Loader. So a little bit of summary which would be like super biased. So, and it will be more like a bunch of random thoughts than, uh, rather than uh, facts. So I did this setup for the Hasura console for all those, all those four languages. And uh, what I noticed is that, you know, uh, when I knew what I want, to, what I need to do, like when I knew what uh, what approach I'm taking and what library I'm going to use, whether I'm going to use some webpack loader or not, what package package manager I want to use, everything was pretty straightforward. But what was uh, more demanding and more time consuming was kind of like figuring out 
what I need to do. For example, in case of Palm and Pure Script, it wasn't uh, there wasn't like one way, one best way to um, add those languages to the existing project. There were a couple of them. So you know, doing this research and figuring out wor what works uh, best for the project is uh, was was actually something that uh, took me took me a while. So uh, another aspect that I, I told you that is important for us is this JavaScript interop. So now let's see uh, how how does it look like. So. Um, JavaScript and Reason, they have pretty similar JavaScript interop. And uh, if you want to call external JavaScript functions uh, in Reason or Proscript calls, you need to provide uh, like type annotations for them. And they, they, they kind of like both require this, uh, this strict boundary between, uh, between those languages and the existing JavaScript code. So this is how the, the bindings look like for in Reason. I have this uh, module no modeling, and I'm saying that uh, it is in no modeling.js file, and I'm declaring that this is a React component that accepts href and text props, and it returns React element. And uh, there is also something called reason package index, where you can uh, kind of search for bindings for popular uh, JavaScript libraries. Now the other way around, uh, reason in JavaScript. So, uh, so I'm kind of like, uh, as I told you, I'm uh, using this best BS platform uh, to to compile reason files, and then I'm consuming this this output, and in this case, I'm consuming uh, index.bs.js, and I'm calling those uh, functions as any other. JavaScript functions. So um, in PureScript, uh, as I mentioned before, uh, you also need to provide explicit type uh, declarations. And um, here's the example of the foreign module. And uh, like the, the name of the foreign module must, must be the same as its companion PureScript module. For example, if you want to have module named list uh, in list.purs file, you would also need to have list.js file. This kind of like associates uh, the foreign module with the PureScript module. So, um, so there is also uh, something similar to uh, reason package index, uh, it's called PureSuit, where you can find uh, pure script bindings for the libraries, you, uh, for like your favorite JavaScript libraries that you want to use. And uh, pure script in JavaScript. So uh, thanks to the uh, webpack loader, I can consume uh, pure script files directly. So, um, so I consuming a button from a button that that pure file, and I'm using it as any other React component. Mm, now, uh, how it looks uh, in case of TypeScript. So, um, if you want to use a JavaScript code in in TypeScript, uh, easily you can uh, enable allow.js tag in compiler options, and it will take type. It will tell TypeScript to look at the JavaScript files and infer types in the JavaScript code. And um, you can also provide uh, declaration files for the particular modules. In this case, I have this dropdown.d.ts file. And I'm, I'm saying that uh, there is a component called dropdown and it has uh, those props of type like options, uh, there's function dismiss, and there's also string position. And also there is uh, there is affinity typed where uh, you can find uh, typings for, uh, for JavaScript libraries. So, uh, so as I said before, uh, TypeScript is a superset of, of JavaScript. Uh, 
uh, which means that uh, TypeScript modules are preferred to be consumed by JavaScript code. So uh, it's also possible that in your JavaScript project, you may be using library that was originally written in TypeScript. And uh, the, the last one, um, so uh, now things are getting more complicated and I have this JavaScript in Elm in quotes uh, um, for a reason. So, um, so this uh, Elm JavaScript interop was pretty easy uh, before Elm 0.18. There was this script tag uh, and you could uh, like put some JavaScript inside and it would be executed. But then to prevent uh, XSS attacks, Elm uh, 0.19 strips this uh, script tag and um, and now there are like uh, I will mention two ways. So there are flags. So you can basically, uh, when you are calling some Elm module, you can uh, pass some flags. Like it would be something that uh, Elm would get on start. And um, for for some like more complicated situations where uh, when uh, you need to send and receive data from. Uh, from JavaScript, well, you can use something called ports. And uh, how it looks like I have this, I'm uh, initializing this app thing, and then I'm subscribing for the cache function. And whenever uh, in a module uh, would be cache function called, then uh, this, this JavaScript uh, part would be uh, like uh, this, this subscribing part would be executed. And a uh, little bit of Elm in JavaScript, uh, specifically uh, in React. So there is this library called React Elm Components, and uh, you can uh, import any, any Elm module and uh, like put it inside of this uh, uh, of this Elm component and uh, have have Elm inside of your React. So uh, that was it for the uh, for the interrupt part. Now uh, there is migration coast. So those four languages, they kind of uh, can be split into two groups, uh, gradually type languages and uh, classic static typing. And um, what is gradual typing? So in the broad sense, it describes like any uh, type system that allows some amount of dynamic typing. And um, yeah, and TypeScript is, is one of them. Uh, which uh, which means that you would have both statically typed and dynamically typed expressions. And also, as the name suggests, uh, it will enable us to introduce static typing to the existing dynamically typed code base gradually. And uh, how it, how it affects our migration is uh, by, uh, by affecting our kind of like mental model. So, um, what happens when we want to migrate JavaScript to Elm, for example. So Elm is something totally different. It has its own architecture. So uh, it kind of means that uh, we need to re rewrite the whole code. We need to write it from scratch. In case of pure script and reason, uh, we can still use React. So uh, it means some kind of like a migration, some uh, some some refactoring, some uh, it also kind of requires changing this mental model, but uh, but not so much as in case of Elm. And then in case of TypeScript, uh, we are still writing code in a similar way as we did in JavaScript. We we are only adding type definitions. Uh, another thing, type uh, soundness. So what, what actually is type soundness? So uh, it's a property of, of type checking system that uh, guarantees that uh, its static type predictions are 
accurate at runtime so that we, we don't have much runtime errors or uh, idling on. And uh, yes, TypeScript, TypeScript is unsound by design and uh, its alternatives on PureScript and Reason, they guarantee way more soundness. But what we need to remember is that uh, dynamic static uh, interop is unsound in all of these languages. Because when we have this idly typed uh, module, we and we want to use uh, some portion of untyped code uh, inside, we can't assume anything about it. Which means we need to check for, uh, we, which kind of means we need to assume that uh, everything can be undefined. So we need to check for everything. For example, here I'm checking if user is uh, not undefined and user some property is not undefined and some other properties are not undefined and it comes with some runtime cost. Um, another as aspect that I mentioned uh, that is important for us is ecosystem. So, um, so basically it's a broad definition and it may mean a lot of things. So, uh, so I will focus on a on couple of them. So, uh, there is this, uh, state of JS, uh, .com's website and, uh, here we can see how popular those languages are. I mean, it's not like a perfect way to, to compare languages, but it can tell us what other people who are using those languages in their projects uh, think about them. And uh, also when it comes to like ID support, uh, I'm a VS Code user, so I'm kind of uh, talking from, from my perspective. So uh, TypeScript is kind of like superior because uh, VS Code was written in TypeScript, so it has like first class support for for this language. However, in case of uh, Reason, PureScript, and Elm, we have like plenty of uh, extensions to to help with this developer experience in in VS Code. So um, so it this uh, this this comfort when using those languages can be also good. Uh, another thing is popularity on GitHub, and it also may it also may not be the best way to compare any framework or, or language. But what what it what it, it can tell us is uh, how community care cares about the, uh, the particular languages, how much community engages in in those languages, and. Uh, it can also tell us, uh, for example, how how big is the community uh, behind the particular language or framework or whatever. And uh, now I'm going to present some kind of like an additional thing. So uh, I found this repository called Real World, Com Real World. and uh, what they did, they uh, we collected implementations of the same application uh, in a bunch of different uh, languages and frameworks. So the, the application is Medium clone. So we have this uh, simple sign in, sign up uh, flow. You have some blog posts, tags, and so on. And I, I kind of I took those uh, five implementations in JavaScript, in Reason, um, and uh, PureScript and TypeScript. And I did some uh, some comparison, like some statistics. And what, uh, what is important here that is going to be like super biased because uh, there are, they are different implementations done by different people. And those people, they, they use different frameworks and they were focusing on different things. For example, someone uh, might have been focusing on performance and someone else uh, might have focused on um, bundle size and and so on so uh so i'm going to present those statistics but please remember there is a huge margin for error and this is um this is the first one bundle size in kilobytes so uh yeah so you can see that uh pure script uh yeah pure script is a lot 
But uh, what we need to remember here is that uh, to, to bundle your script uh, application, we are bundling also this core library. So it's not like it would grow exponentially uh, comparing to the other languages uh, when, when app grows. Uh, it would kind of stop at some point because um, there is this like fixed amount of, of uh, code that needs to be bundled, this core library. And then we have uh, we have this additional our application code. Uh, I also have bundling time in milliseconds. So uh, what can be the, the output here is that Elm is really, really fast. And uh, now this, this was it for the comparison. I think we can uh, do some Q&A session right now to discuss it. Artem, are you? Yeah. One moment. I will, yep, I show. So uh, the first question, uh, I think it should be for the previous part, but uh, why do not you have flow in your op options? Flow GS. Yeah, so again, the answer is the same. Uh, it's like, uh, yeah, we just, uh, we just didn't uh, think about it too much. I mean, it was one of the options that we kind of eliminated uh, very fast. Okay. Uh, the next thing about uh, the Elm interrupt, uh, you have just shown uh, about the uh, putting some values from JavaScript uh, to the context uh, evaluation context of Elm. But could we put an actually JavaScript function uh, to Elm context? Uh, no. So as I said, there was this script tag, so you could uh, you could write any like JavaScript inside of Elm file. But now it's not possible. So the way to communicate to kind of like add some JavaScript to, to Elm is through ports. Okay. Uh, and the last one about, uh, uh, I don't remember actually slight number, but it's about bundle size in kilobytes. Okay. And uh, I saw that uh, JavaScript have greater bundle size than Type pure JavaScript uh, bundle size uh, was greater than uh, TypeScript bundle size. How? Yeah. Why? <laughs> uh, yeah. So as I said, it's like uh, there are different implementations, and uh, and you know maybe it means that when you are writing TypeScript, you are uh, you know you are writing less code because you are focusing on some yeah. other things. But uh, no. But really, what why it was like that? So in in JavaScript. Uh, there was React and there was Redux. And in case of this TypeScript example, as, as far as I remember, uh, the author used web components. So, you know, uh, getting rid of React and Redux might have uh, caused this, mm. uh, this okay, um, difference. So, yeah, let's continue. Okay, cool. Okay, so now the final part. Uh, what did we choose? So uh, we had those four options, and uh, and now uh, I'm going to eliminate uh, each one of them uh, by the by the aspects that were important. So first, we needed good uh, JavaScript interop. And as I said before, it was, it, it's not perfect with Elm. So, uh, I'm sorry, by Elm. And then we needed a straightforward setup and good ID support, uh, which also like, uh, so Reason and PureScript were kind of similar. Uh, however, uh, with Reason, it was slightly better. So this is how we eliminated PureScript. And then we also need a low migration cost and uh, gradually type language as TypeScript uh, kind of uh, was giving us what we, what we needed. So yeah, we decided to go with TypeScript. And now uh, I do a bit of why. 
So uh, Asura console is big open source project, and what it means that uh, this low migration cost, as as we have in with TypeScript, allows us to keep velocity high and to maintain this development speed. And it's also as it's open source, uh, this the smallest difference between languages uh, won't scare contributors. So we would still have like a uh, community support for s and some contributions to our project. And it turned out that uh, gradually type language fits our needs and uh, it may not be perfect. This uh, type inference may not be uh, so good as in its alternatives. However, uh, like considering the, the aspects that were crucial for our particular project, uh, we decided that this is this is it. This is what we want to adopt. And uh, actually, we already have TypeScript uh, in our project. Uh, it was uh, this this pull request was merged, I guess, in March. And uh, I also at some point created this uh, migrate to TypeScript issue. And I was pretty surprised because like a uh, day after I created it, we already had some contributions and um, we actually had a lot of contributions and community helped a lot with, with this migration. We, uh, uh, in summary, we had uh, 34 uh, pull requests and uh, more than 20 are already merged. So, so it's pretty awesome. And uh, we, we haven't migrated the whole code base yet. And uh, it will take a while. But uh, yeah, we, we migrated the ma major part of, of the console code. So we are on the good path. And uh, as for the summary, uh, so we chose TypeScript, but we had like a unique project, we were a unique team. So uh, would we choose TypeScript if we were like starting a project from scratch or if we had different project, different team? I'm not so sure about. So uh, so if you are like uh, facing this, this problem and if, if you are also kind of discussing in your team uh, what, uh, what static, uh, statically type language uh, you, you would like to uh, adopt, then uh then maybe you have more possibilities and remember that it's not about the language because the language may be perfect and the language may have like tons of features but it's about the context and what is what context is is the mostly the people that your team what your team would be comfortable with and it's your project and uh, it's also the, the goals of the project, the state of the project, and so on. So um, if you want to uh, know more about Hasura, there are a couple of links. And if you, after this conference, if you have, uh, if you still want to attend another conference, then uh, you can attend Hasura. -con. And uh, for now, thank you very much for, for being here. And I hope that uh, my my talk uh, was useful for you. Okay, I think we will make uh, the last question answer session. Uh, first question is about uh, runtime types. Did you thought about runtime types, and are you utilizing something like IOTS or something uh, some other uh, libraries to implement? dynamic run, uh, runtime typing uh, in your TypeScript code. Yeah, I remember uh, some time ago, uh, there was some uh, something on Twitter and someone asked me if I'm using uh, IOTS and FPTS, uh, like if, if I'm just using it. And then I, I uh, replied with, yes, I, I'm using it in my site projects, but not at Hasura yet. So, and then the, the author yeah. of those libraries, um, like this tweet. So, uh, yeah, we, I, I thought about this, but, you know, it took me a while to kind of like, you know, adopt TypeScript and to, um, to, you know, to make team, uh, to, to actually like TypeScript. So I may wait <laughs> a bit until I, you know, start bragging about, 
uh, stuff like IOTS and FPTS because it's like kind of like a next level. And uh, yeah, it's something that many programmers I know are not comfortable with. Okay, yeah, and I uh, want to add that we had a talk about typed contracts a year, uh, one year ago, or no, it was at previous HolyJS in Moscow. Uh, I share the link uh, to the talk, and at the talk, uh, uh, Artyom covered the uh, topic about uh, runtime uh, strong typing. Uh, she, uh, she talked about uh, the actual um, typed contracts and uh, like about IOTS and why uh, the option when we compile our static types uh, to runtime static type uh, to runtime strong types uh, is not enough and why we need to first of all describe uh, runtime types and after that inference actual static type. Yeah. Uh, and the next question about uh, uh, about uh, the um, yeah, about the Spark. Uh, how do you feel about uh, this new uh, package manager and build tool for PureScript? Because uh, uh, before, as I know, was a Bower, and Bower is a pretty yeah, old tool. Yeah, yeah, and Bower is kind of like deprecated. So I didn't even think about this till I like about using it. And I was also considering uh, there was PSC package, and. Uh, no, I, I, I actually, I, I used it, but, uh, you know, I was trying like different approaches. I mean, I was trying, you know, add, uh, adding this webpack loader and I was also trying to kind of like, uh, like, uh, compile those files, uh, separately and then watch for, for the output. So, um, yeah, so I decided to go with Spago because it was also a build tool. So, because it was kind of like working better with this second approach with like uh, uh, building the, the JavaScript for pure script and then watching for, for the output. Cool. Yeah. And one more question. I heard that you have a maintainer of pure script in your team. And uh, how did he react about the opportunity to use uh, pure script in Hasura? So, actually, uh, yeah. So, he he actually started this discussion so one day he posted a message on slack that uh he can uh do some kind of like presentation on pure script and about state of pure script in like the uh modern web, web development and uh yeah then i i replied that i can do typescript and someone else replied about uh reason and then another person about um so uh yeah so uh he actually uh, started this this whole discussion, but uh, then he said that uh, TypeScript is <laughs> actually a good choice for us. So it's not like uh, he he kind of uh, was persuading us to use PureScript. But yeah, I, I I know it's kind of like a pity to not use PureScript when you have a PureScript creator on board. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. maybe we would migrate some parts. This is this no. great thing about AltJS that you can like mix all of those languages and then yeah. have JavaScript output. Okay, the next question is, uh, if you have the end on Haskell, why not PureScript? The kind of similar in some way and you might have like full stack way for uh, de uh, development of your system. Yeah, I mean, if we if we would have chosen a uh, pure script, then I guess uh, Phil would need to switch teams from backend to frontend and helping like he would need to help out with everything <laughs> because, uh, you know, it's uh, as I said before, that it's not about the language, but about the context. And as we didn't have anyone comfortable with pure script, except for a pure script creator who was in, in a different team, then it just wouldn't be it wouldn't be a good fit for for the project. I mean, we okay, wouldn't actually, be be very productive with with it, at least at, mm. the, at the beginning. Yeah, and actually, the question from my side is about how many full stack developers do you have in your team? Uh, yes. Yeah, so. Uh, 
So I don't think that there is anyone who is working like on a daily basis on both server code and front end code. I mean, there are people who are, you know, working on one team and then sometimes contributing to, to, to the, like another team, but, uh, yeah, so, so that's, that's it. But actually we have a, a new person and he is really, uh, like happy about contributing to, to the Haskell code and to, uh, like JavaScript TypeScript code. Okay. Actually, I see, I thought that uh, the question should uh, sound like, uh, did you have uh, someone who can code and in JavaScript and in Haskell? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, uh, we have those people. Yeah, we do. Yeah. Oh, okay. But they they are. I mean, you know, it's like separate teams and they have like separate things to to work on. Okay, and uh, maybe the last one question, I think, yeah, or maybe we have enough time for one more, uh, one more question after that, but uh, why type safety isn't presented in your list of important points? I mean uh, that uh, maybe type safety, it's um, uh, killer, uh, it's uh, not a feature of TypeScript, yep, because uh, uh, they have not sound system by design. So, uh, is, isn't it this point important for your team or why didn't it present? Uh, yeah, so, uh, so I didn't, uh, put it in those, in this list because, uh, it was, so the type safety is what, it was the reason why we wanted statically taped language. So it was like, uh, like a base of, of, uh, what we wanted, but, um, we were okay with like type safety level in all of those languages. So, uh, we were okay in like type safety that we would get from TypeScript and that the one that we would get from PureScript. So this is why, um, like, uh, I didn't put it into, into this, this, uh, list. Okay. <laughs> the next question, where do you search Haskell developers? Where do you search Haskell developers? Yeah. Uh, so I think it's not a question to me, but to, 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 uh, other people from Hasura who are hiring people, yep. but I, I think we are pretty successful in hiring Haskell developers. Mm. I think that, uh, yeah, yeah, we have plenty of them <laughs> actually. So, uh, we are doing a good job here. <laughs> okay. Um, and actually, if you're interested in Haskell job, I will share the link to Telegram chat, uh, which uh, share uh, news about uh, new job position at different companies in Haskell. Yep. And maybe the last question, I heard that a prison maintainer uh, make a lot of pull requests to Hasura related to this fee, uh, to, related to this uh, part of rewriting of Hasura in TypeScript. H how it's feel? <laughs> Um, yeah, it, it felt great. I mean, yeah, I mean, we have, uh, we had like a, a guy who is working at Prisma and he submitted like a couple of pull requests that were actually pretty good. So, you know, it's, it's a nice, 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 uh, nice thing. I mean, yeah, uh, mm, pretty funny as well. <laughs> okay. Uh, did, did you contribute to Prisma? of like an answer for this movement? Uh, no, no, I haven't, but maybe I will think about this. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I think we end our, complete our question answer session, Vitaly, where are you? Okay, and actually from my side, uh, in duration we're waiting for Vitaly, uh, I tried maybe pure, the pure script language maybe uh, two years ago when uh, uh, they have only Bower and it was really terrible. I, I like a lot Haskell language, for example, yeah, and uh, I, for example, we have an, uh, a channel in JavaScript Ninja uh, in Telegram uh, and Telegram bot was written in Haskell. <laughs> uh, so, and I decided to try pure script language, but 
I had a lot of, first of all, warnings uh, by Pure Script compiler. The secondly, I have a lot of problems with packages because Bower installed a wrong uh, version for a different version of compiler of Pure Script. And uh, yeah, it was a lot of problem related uh, uh, to the Bower and version checking. But for now, I think I don't touch and uh, Sparvo, but I think I will touch to see how it is. We have Vitaly here. Yeah, I'm here. Hello, guys. Oh, guys. Sorry, I like that's <laughs> that's already in the in the core of my mind. Yeah, I see. Thanks. I think it's a gender neutral world, guys. Yeah, ah. yeah. I think it's okay. Yeah. It's I will, I'm thing. always afraid of this uh, kind of because like a lot of people <laughs> telling me that I'm not kinder. Very, very good with this stuff. So, how, Artyom, what's what is your impression of the talk? I like a lot this talk because uh, uh, actually I want to, to make the same uh, uh, content at uh, I don't remember actually conference name. Maybe it was uh, uh, F Pure or something like that in uh, Minsk. So, yep, yeah, I want to make a comparison between this force technology and additionally. Uh, Fable, it's an F sharp to JavaScript compiler and uh, the um, Scala JS. So I, uh, I I wanted to take a developer, for example, junior developer, and uh, impl uh, to he, he should to try implement in different technologies some components. So yeah, I like a lot this talk. Yeah, also I also like that talk. It was very interesting. So thank you very much, guys. Thank you.